we start, let me give you a quick briefing and why why we are discussing such kind of risk assessment and why it really matters here. So to to to, to sustain your business and expand your business in the future, you need to change your approach from being reactive to be a reactive approach. And the successful way of having this kind of reactive approach is to identify your potential problems in the future. And this is the academic definition of, you know, risk versus issue. So that's that's the whole idea, is to be able to identify what's going to happen in the future, to set some mitigation action plans, or to accept uh, what's happening and reduce the impact that might hit the company. This is a successful way to, to ensure your business sustainability and growing in the future. Uh, uh, each year, as companies, we sit with our consultants and we sit with our uh, leadership teams to identify the issues that might hit the company, also to see what are the risks that are hitting other companies within the same industry or within the same geographic markets, to identify, to, to see how we are going to allocate resources and with, what are the risks that we are going to mitigate and what are the risks that we are going to accept. Having said that, I picked up a couple of uh, risk areas that I could hear that many companies are going to work on uh, in, in, in the next year. So the first one, which we all hear about, Ukraine war. So we will not talk about uh, you know why this happened and how to work on that, but we can see some consequences and some impact impacting the, 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 the markets based on the U.S. sanctions on Russia. So this is something really, really important we need to consider here. So first thing, we have some supply chain issues, lead time. Uh, so I was in a meeting with some supply chain colleagues, they told me that the lead time in some areas, instead of four days, it became four weeks. So this is something also we need to consider. And when the lead time is expanding, so we may lose the market share to our competitors if, if the competitors, they already have some distribution uh, spots where they can ship the products in, you know, in a shorter time than we do. Um, in addition, we can see the oil prices and the increase of the freight cost. So this is also something increasing the cost. We may consider some uh, diagnostic uh, pricing approach to, you know, to minimize the impact uh, to the company. I, I wouldn't go through too many details because we still don't know when this crisis is going to end. But we, we, we need as companies internal management to, to collaborate closely to see how we mitigate and in most cases we will accept the risk and maybe uh, you know uh, reduce the impact a little bit. Another one, so most of people were talking about COVID, um, how we react to COVID, but now we are in the endemic of COVID. So we, we talk about the consequences and the impact, uh, how we move forward. So the, actually, the, the COVID left us with two things. First, the global economic conditions. So we could see uh, a lot of markets are collapsing, uh, inflation rates. Uh, a lot of countries announced double digits inflation rate in, during Q1 2022, which is really, really impacting us. We need to change our marketing commercial strategy. We need to check the pricing strategy, cost reduction, which is really uh, a problem. Uh, we have also problem in the raw materials for the manufacturing companies. So this is something also we need. We may need to qualify the subsidiary uh, suppliers to, you know, to get the to get the resources. Uh, last one, which is also problem. I know I'm talking too much here, but anyways. Uh, so this will be my last point. The, the, the last one, the purchasing power. A lot of people lost their jobs, okay? We're losing our consumers. 
So the people will be losing, yeah. So people don't have the ability to buy anymore, to purchase anymore. So again, so it's all about pricing, cost reduction, and maybe uh, uh, innovation. So to do to do something like that. So that's just two risk from two twenty from twenty 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 two. I I know we have tons of risk, but so those are the top risk in my point of view. Thanks, Ahmed. I think what you touched upon is so, uh, and it's very close to my heart. Right? And and for all the compliance officers is how to be more proactive than reactive, because if it is reactive, you know, your train is on fire. And for compliance and legal business conduct, our train is perpetually on fire. So on that, um, on that fiery note, maybe, Adil, it would be great to hear from you, your views. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope I... Audible? No, I... Hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, Emma has, I mean, covered most of the risks. I mean, I will just, uh, I mean, throw up, throw light upon the uh, some of the risks which we have seen previously in the past two, three years. I mean, I mean, and more as well. I mean, the and the uh, uh, after the COVID, when the uh, technology has completely changed our lives. I mean, uh, whether it's consumer or whether it's a institution or an organization, the way we used to work, the way we used to handle the, I mean, business, the operations, everything has changed. Uh, we have become more advanced, obviously. I mean, uh, 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 our operations have, uh, I mean, much better. I mean, uh, more efficient as compared to, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I would say pre-COVID situation. However, uh, I mean, um, as we say, um, in terms of uh, Star Wars uh, terminology, that uh, same opportunities are also available to the dark side of the force as well. So the, so the uh, uh, criminals also have, I mean, gained the, I mean, uh, knowledge, the technology also. So the threat of cyber security, the cyber crime is more as compared to previous years. I mean, it is becoming more and more, I mean, uh, important, I mean, more and more, I mean, critical for the uh, organizations to spend more, uh, I mean, resources on the uh, uh, their cyber security uh, policies. Uh, one of the important factor in fighting the cyber crime is the, uh, uh, obviously the, I mean, the, I mean, the systems and everything, I mean, should be there, but of course the, uh, human factor, giving training to the staff. I mean, uh, one seemingly unsuspicious email with a link might hamper the complete, I mean, I mean, all your operation, all your securities will be, I mean, will fail. So, I mean, we have to spend more money, more resources on the, on training our uh, employees. Second, I would say, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, in 2022, we would be seeing more and more changes in the regulatory, uh, I mean, uh, environment. I mean, I mean, regulators are getting more stricter. Uh, I mean, you look at from the FATF perspective as well. I mean, I mean, uh, especially UAE is now in the gray list. Uh, COVID also has played an important role. So uh, uh, global global pressure is also there. I mean, I mean, UAE wants to be. I mean, I mean, uh, as part of. I mean, they want to be in line with the most advanced. I mean, nations. So I mean, data privacy laws are there now. So obviously, I mean, these these will gonna affect. Uh, I mean, organization in the 2022 as well. Uh, and of course, as Ahmed has said, I mean the, I mean political and uh, uh, economical situation will gonna really affect every organization, especially I mean for the compliance officer who cannot sleep nowadays <laughs> because of the sanctions every other day. I mean, uh, uh, in the breakfast we are eating sanctions, in the after <laughs> lunch also we are eating sanctions. I mean, nothing else is there. So I mean, uh, I mean uh, these, I mean situation really will gonna, I mean, I mean, I mean the uh, uh, organization will be facing in the future. Absolutely. And I think what you said is very relevant is uh, the COVID situation has taught us how to be uh, more agile. Yep. And um, and I was discussing that with Samir uh, just before or during lunch that we have shared so many panels together, but today is the first time that we have met in person. So the good part is, of course, that, uh, you know, we're able to at least interact if it's virtually, but bad part is not in person. And of course, given you've already mentioned about it, how many risks are there? And especially because, you know, very few of us are working in one jurisdiction now. It's all of our functions are typically cross jurisdiction, cross country with GDPR, you know, US uh, privacy or US data protection laws. So it's, it's, we have to be very careful about how we are doing. Our risk analysis has substantially changed over these two years. Uh, so on that note, uh, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll ask Samit uh, that, you know, what with these changing risks each time or with these changing scenarios, what is your uh, way, uh, what is your 
thoughts on a good compliance program about the GRC program that we can put together and what how relevant is maybe agility and specifically you're also CS so it would be great to hear the risks on directors you know some of these points if you can uh, help us understand yeah I think um, uh, it's very important because uh, so what I believe is I think the risk management framework or governance has to be set at the top frankly because you know you have to set the tone at the top and it has to be built in the culture of the organization that's very very important the framework which we as she rightly said the framework whatever is there um, you know uh, has to be with the, with the blessing of the board but at the same time awareness of that framework within the stakeholder is very very important you know, in, in every, in a, inevitably, we have, what happens is, you know, we make the framework, we get it approved by the board, but what happens is then it goes down somewhere and, you know, nobody bothers to even look at that. So all these steps which are very important in that is that, number one, that it has to be, um, you know, blessed by the board audit committee, risk management committee also now we have, so it has to be properly, uh, you know, uh, properly should be there, submitted at the, risk, at the audit committee, risk management committee, they should approve it. and uh you know it's, it's not it's not a job of a legal guy it's not a job of a uh, any business guy so it, it is a combined effort that combined combined effort that all of us has to take so and then you know making aware all of them may it be it your supplier be it your um, customer or you know employees I, I i normally think that you know even the awareness of the employees is very very low that you know what are the risk policies and what are the kind of a thing for example whistleblower policy we have so sometimes you know people uh, are not aware of it that how to do about that for the vendors although for the creditors also so so i think uh, it's very important that uh, it should be taken holistically by the board not just the sake of compliance but you know to be implemented and uh, as i said the tone at the top is to be set because even you know the tone when when the board is serious about it the people below the board is definitely serious about it and nowadays there's a lot of responsibility for example i'm seeing that you know uh, for example insider trading i was i was just looking at that so sebi in india has made managing director ceo totally completely responsible for any fraud any any insider trading uh, violation etc in many other uh, you know uh, risk related issues or compliance related issues now the board is directly responsible and unnecessary may somebody else you know below the line is doing some non-compliance and SWAT suddenly, you know, falls on the board of directors. So I think I think very important to the tone at the top. Absolutely. And another thing that you uh, very interestingly touched uh, is it's it's a combined effort. It's not the job of legal and business conduct or compliance alone. And also what I, I uh, I'm a big advocate is it's also a tone from bottom to up. It's very relevant that uh, that what are people at field force or people at the grassroots, what do they think about compliance? Do they think it's just a tick box? And a lot of us are from healthcare as well, Adil and both uh, Ahmed, I, we both, we all are from healthcare companies. And, you know, for us, it is also relevant, not only about the risks that we have with public officials, but also the risks and the kind of interaction we have with healthcare professionals. And we sitting as uh, legal and business conduct officers, we don't interact with the healthcare professionals on a daily basis. You know, our knowledge on, on compliance can do only that much. So it is very important that our people, our ambassadors of anti-corruption, compliances, governances. Another thing that, uh, you know, I, I uh, very strongly believe is cultural sensitivity. So, you know, I've been doing anti-corruption work since 2009. And one of the articles that I read, they, they stressed about cultural sensitivity. And at the age of maybe 25, and yes, I've disclosed my age, uh, at the age of 25, 26, I was like, you know, what is cultural sensitivity? If it is, if it is a bribe, it is a bribe. If it is wrong, it is wrong. But then as you grow and mature and understand more of anti-corruption, be it through FCPA, through UK Bribery Act, or your local laws, you understand is there is a lot of, uh, and since we have a lot of Indians here, the chalta hai attitude, which is, okay, it can be for non-Hindi speaking people. Okay, it's all right. That is something that, you know, uh, our laws don't tolerate. 
Um, the Indian Anti-Bribery Act is one of the strictest in the world. The problem is about, of course, about enforcement. So it is very relevant, I think, and, and Samit also alluded that our program should, we should strive to be perfect, it to be perfect, but it should be more on the practical side. Do people understand it? Do, does it match the country that you are intending it for? And does it align with what people think? I think that is very, very important. It is a living organism. It is not one envelope that fits all. So um, I think we always strive to, as lawyers, as business conduct, we strive for perfection. But I think what Samit is also mentioning is it should be really practical, which which works with everyone. Yeah, right? and, and uh, thanks, Salonia, for, for emphasizing that. And also, you know, uh, also about the white collar crimes. I'm, it's very very fascinating to you know see about the white collar crimes. But what happens is, in an organization, you know, generally you end up doing a crime which you may not have done actually, and that's where the problem is because you people don't know about the compliances. People are not aware of it. Now, if you really see all the white collar crimes, Crimes. Uh, most of the crimes are either for the greed and I don't know why people need more money because white collar crimes generally are done by the people who you know you look forward as a role model frankly and also they are on a, on a, on a good position and, you know take an example of Rajat Gupta in US, uh, US for the insider trading scam and all why should he need more money but I'm told that he, he didn't do that for the money he didn't gain anything he was passing on information to somebody else his friend so either it's a greed or it's unawareness, right? So the unawareness part is something which is uh, creating a lot of problem because greed is some, greed is not a crime unless you break the law. Simple. So if you're making, if you're breaking the law for the greed, you should be punished. That's fine, you know. But point is unawareness. If I am a CEO of the company, CXO, or you know some other senior position, the guy below me is doing some fraud or doing some insider trading or doing something which is a white collar crime. And I am not aware of it that he is doing crime. He may not be aware of it because there is uh, there is no awareness session for that. Problem is that you know the person the law is very stringent about that. Now you may not be aware of it, but still you are stuck. Still you are you know people are behind the bar. I have seen that you know what they have done is either they were not aware of it. So I was reading a book, uh, uh, read a book written by uh, one of the prosecutor of Enron case, frankly. He's, he's very well written in his book. He says that white collar crimes are basically prosecuted on the context that how much you are aware of this crime. You know, this is one of the great defense of that, but this is also doesn't remove you from your liability. That means you need to be aware of it. And it, so that's the reason I say that it has to be stone has to be set at the top. When the top people takes it seriously, it will go to this. It will go below the seriously. So I would add, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, uh, as uh, I mean, he said, I mean, the awareness should be there. And as Sunali said, I mean, uh, anti-financial crime program should be a living organism. I mean, it should always be communicated. I mean, continuously to all the employees. Training should be given to all the employees. It should not happen. Okay, tick the box and then uh, okay, the policy is in our shelf. I mean, no, it should never be. I mean. In the end, I mean, consequences, I mean, only organization has to face the consequences. If somebody has done a fraud or somebody has done a financial crime, I mean, so, I mean, uh, that employee obviously will going to suffer, but the, I mean, the uh, company, the shareholders, they have to, they also have to face the music, I mean. Yeah, absolutely, because this is what is happening. And, you know, the total size of the fraud I was reading somewhere globally is around, only fraud in the white collar gram is around five trillion, five and a half trillion dollars. You can under, you can see that how much white collar crime of fraud is happening nowadays and this is one of the fraud and then there are other white collar crimes also so it's very very important uh, that you know the the framework has to be very very um, strict and uh, people should know that you know what is to be done what so, so Absolutely. awareness is important i think um, and i think samit you and both adil said it's not about what you know it is also about what you ought to have known i think that's the differentiation keeping a blind eye is not a solution oh we are not doing let our agents do it. Okay, so that's something which is, which stays inexcusable. And, um, and you know, Manvendra, maybe I'll take the, now the mic to you. And um, you work a lot with directors as an, uh, you know, as a private practitioners, you often, uh, you know, advise them, it would be great to understand, you know, maybe mindsets of directors as well, and how you pacify them, if I can say it like that, and the risks that you have often seen on them. 
Uh, no, definitely. I mean, like, it's great to hear from uh, two compliance councils about, you know, how they feel with regards to white collar crime being unawareness. But okay, uh, I mean, like, before I start, let's have a quick show. How many in-house councils do we have in the room? Can we have a quick show of hands? How many of you have got midnight calls from someone saying, hey, the director's got a summon. What do we do next? Or not phases? In India, 100% you'd have phased it. And, and what was the reaction? Do we, like, so let's send a letter and ask them for five days or seven days' time, appoint a council, or you go. The dieters has been summoned, but you go and attend. Which, which one was it? What did transpire? Right? Cool. So that's, that, that, that's the classic scenario for you. Uh, let's understand one thing. Uh, when we talk about risk, when we talk about compliance, when we talk about white collar crimes today, the buck does stop at the management at a multiple level. Right? I mean, uh, given the number of Indian lawyers here, I'll just quickly just tell you there are 17 different legislations and 36 sections which only penalize directors, no matter what has happened. So, and, and, and to, because the pharma guys are here, uh, there's a case, and uh, sorry, the pharma people are here, my bad. Uh, there's a case where a truck driver who was transporting medicines from a factory tried to bribe a toll gate guy for 120 rupees, which is 6 AED. Uh, there is a Prevention of Corruption Act case today against the director of the pharma company because contrary to popular belief under Prevention of Corruption Act in India, an attempt to bribe is a crime. A bribery by a third person is a crime since 2018. And, and that's where, honestly, the levels are when it comes to laws in India. The problem, and not just India, I think globally, just like Saloni mentioned, your UK anti-bribery, your uh, FCPAs, those are the big boys in the room. Everyone knows about that. But if you have any French councils here or, you know, entities, you heard of Sepantor? It's a new law which came in 2017, which the compliance levels of which are thrice that of any other known legislation. And why this is important, very simply is, Today, unlike the culture earlier, where the director was the last resort, you know, you don't go and grab the director unless you've really sorted out. The enforcement agencies and regulators have realized that if you go to the director, everything falls in place. So you're summoned straight away, go to the director. Like an intermediary platform, which is sharing videos by a third party, a director will get summoned saying that, hey, this particular video that you've uploaded is against religious sentiments, against whatever, any of the ground. What's the director going to do? The director doesn't even have an idea of the, who the user exists. But similarly, let's look at the landscape from a risk perspective. Let's all understand now that the landscape is not the same anymore. Like if a director is getting summons, at some point of time, you'll have to honor the summons. I mean, anyone who's dealt with banking supervision and fraud department of CBI, irrespective of whether your firm or your company took a loan or not, if there was money which has flown into your company, there are summons which are being sent out to the directors today. And these guys are not budging because they want the information at the end of the day. So coming to how do you ring fence, how do you pacify, I think one thing which is very important is to convey there's no sense of entitlement anymore. If you have got a summons under 160 of CRPC, your statement is being summoned. How do you deal with it is a different thing. Let's get a representation in, let's put the documents in, we dilute your role in it. But there's no concept anymore that oh, just because you're a director or a KMP or a promoter, you will be able to get away from it. I think interestingly, Samid and we were just chatting about a raid that had happened earlier today. But uh, Serious Fraud Investigation Office in India has gone and arrested nine people over the last 72 hours. And these are all cases from 2018. The reason is they've not done anything in four years. So how do you ensure that the directors be present? Go and arrest them. That's, that's, that's the landscape today when it comes to regulators. And uh, I think the three points that I would want to make here is, uh, one, please understand the underlying legislation under which you have received a summons, a tax summon, a FEMA summon, a CBI summon, an EOW summon, these are all different. How do you deal with it is going to be a different parameter. Please do not take it casually or send a letter acknowledging or, you know, saying that, oh, you've given me a summons, but my GC is going to come. You know, these are things which sort of create a bad paper trail for you. If you if you're not comfortable taking a call yourself, engage a third party counsel. That's not a problem. But at the same time, please be very aware of what is the risk and where do you stand in the transaction. 
I'm pretty sure all of you would be seeing a surge in internal investigations now. And the read for that is because it's the KMPs and the directors. You recast accounts, the audit committee will go after the director. They won't come after the person who's, let's say, forging invoices or anything. And, and that sort of is the landscape that we are looking at uh, from a multiple regulatory aspect, not just a simple compliance aspect today. And, you know, Manvendra, what I have also found very interesting is that, and the way I always uh, mention it to my team members, uh, whether when I was a private, private practitioner now in-house, that I always try to convey that a compliance uh, program, whether it's uh, statutory compliances or anti-corruption or white collar crime compliances, it not only protects the company, but it also protects you as a person, whether you're a director or key managerial person. And it's not about only uh, what kind of summons you get, I think, but it also um, it's also about reputation, which is unquantifiable uh, damage, as I always say it not only for the company and um, like both me, Adil, as well as Ahmed, we're all from healthcare and a lot of people move from one company to the other. So, you know, you know, your reputation always proceeds. So if you, somebody knows Saloni has maybe, you know, taken an action against an X person or Gilead has taken an action against an X person, you know, Bosch or any other company will not be very keen to engage him or her. So, it is very important that when we are communicating to our team members, whether as a private practitioner or uh, as an in-house counsel, please tell them that it protects you as well. Because I think we are all very selfish. We all like to protect ourselves uh, before, uh, before than anyone. And another thing um, that I always say is that some of the terminologies that we use in compliance are, I think, very harsh. You know investigation now if you take a salesperson personnel and say you know an investigation has been initiated against you we'll be like oh what did i do so it is very important that we sometimes you know tweak our words and we lawyers or compliance officers are very good at doing that is maybe you know rename it as fact finding exercise it's the same thing you're still doing your work you're still investigating but for a non lawyer or a non compliance person i think he he or she will be able to digest this i think in a better fashion. So, no, absolutely. Um, sorry, just, just the yeah. moment when I was speaking about directors, I could see uh, Zara, Saurav, and three other people who are who I know are white collar practitioners, all mouth. Directors don't have vicarious liability. Say it, <laughs> say it. Hum bacha sakta hai. But yeah, I mean, see, you have you have all these defenses out there, absolutely. and you and you know how to play the game. The question is really knowing when to do what, and that that is critical. That is critical the way. You put it out just now. Yeah. And the funny part is when, you know, one of the companies, they approached me to be a director. So my my parents who are uh, non-lawyers, they said, oh, wow, you're getting promoted. I was like, no, I'm not taking that. But of course, that was on a lighter note. Of course, you like you said, you know what to do, when to do and how to do it. I think that's what it is. We cannot run an organization or we cannot give an advice as a uh, private practitioner, which is foolproof, which is risk free. So it is all about right, maybe risk analysis and also the the digestion capacity of the organization. So on that um, on that note, maybe you know I'll move to um, to Pooja and ask. You know we have been uh, talking about technology, cybersecurity. It would be lovely to hear your views, the risks, and you know how to cope up with them. Thanks, Saloni. Am I audible? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I think the case for technology is made. You know, the previous panel, when they spoke about AI, and throughout the day, we have been listening to data protection and risk as a whole. So the case for technology is made that is going to be um, integral to GRC. It already has been for a few years. And going forward, I think it's just going to be, we're going to become more and more reliant on that. So uh, for instance, take blockchain. Right. Blockchain is a way of protecting that integrity. It's integrity management of data and of evidence. So essentially, now GRC is what? It's all about audit audit trails. It's, an, it's, it's a huge part of it. Um, so 
audit platforms these days do employ technologies like this so that it kind of removes that uncertainty and takes the burden off of traditional technologies because technology itself has advanced, much like artificial intelligence. Do we need that? Yes, absolutely, like the previous panelists said. Um, why? Because we deal with multiple regimes, multiple regulatory regimes across the globe. Now, if you are a multinational, you know that you have to deal with different standards in different countries and within a country, as Manavendra said, a lot of different um, regulations. And um, now with the emergence of ESG, we are living in an ESG world, and I believe it is a convergence of GRC and ESG. The underlying concept of both is risk management. And uh, I know that eventually ESG is going to get standardized, as one of the previous speakers was speaking. But right now, we have GRI, we have SASB, we have CDP, we have many different standards, many different scoring mechanisms. Now, this last large volumes of data, this barrage of data coming at you, it is truly beyond the ability of traditional technology. Therefore, we have big data, we have analytics, we have artificial intelligence, and most importantly, machine learning where the machine is getting smarter, learning the patterns, and predictability is coming in, not to mention RPA or robotic process automation, where some of those repetitive tasks in GRC is kind of removed. So um, technology is going to be an integral part, and the sooner we adopt, the better it is. And I think innovation is going to be a constant need. We're going to have to continually innovate to stay ahead of the curve. Thanks, Pooja. And, um, and maybe, Adil, you mentioned about cybersecurity, you know, and to what Pooja said, would you like to add something further or from I mean, an in-house counsel? Uh, obviously, I mean, for any GRC professional or any GRC framework, the technology plays a key role. Uh, I mean, I will give just a small example. As a compliance officer, I have to, uh, I mean, we have to make sure that our transactions and the customers are, I mean, are free from any uh, sanction, I mean, uh, regime. Uh, we are not breaking any sanctions rule. So uh, obviously, uh, the 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 uh, speed uh, speed at which the transactions are happening, and uh, I mean the same way we have to do the I mean screening as well, clear the transactions. So it cannot happen in with a tra I mean traditional system. Obviously, AI technology is there to help us. I mean, uh, and machine learning always keep on uh, uh, creating the I mean the improving the rules, creating more and more better results. I mean. So when we are, I mean, handling uh, thousands of transactions a day, I mean, and the and also we have to, uh, as Pooja said, I mean, we have to comply with several regimes. I mean, I mean, USA, UK, I mean, Europe, and now, I mean, the war is going on. So we have so many sanctions. It is not possible for any traditional system to work on. I mean, to comply. I mean, to ensure that okay, we comply with these. I mean, uh, requirement. So obviously, uh, the uh, uh, AI technology really will gonna help. I mean, in the I mean, the future as well. Uh, secondly, of course, the uh, the cloud computing or the cloud storage. I mean, it is really helping us. I mean, I mean to move our resources. I mean, uh, whether it's uh, I mean I mean uh, back end processes or the front end processes, it is really go go ha are helping, and it will gonna help us in the future as well. Yeah. So one thing I I, I like to add something on this is you yeah, absolutely you are true you are right, but you know uh, one thing we have to remember is that uh, depending upon the organization, depending on the sector, depending upon the kind of work you do. There has to be customization of the risk. That is very, very important because, you know, in, in generally what we have seen is particularly in the tool, artificial intelligence is helping some, to some extent, but in the tools and what, what we have seen is that they have given the equal weightage to each and every compliances, each and every risk. But then, you know, somebody has to do, a, you know, something to actually customize. You have to, you have to quantify the risk basically, and then you have to give a value to that. Maybe, you know, a risk which is very big for me may not be big for your industry. Maybe, you know, you can ignore that. And other than that, you know, whichever you think that, uh, you know, which people are to be aware, which people are not to be aware in that, which are to be included. And then, so, so customization as well as quantification of the risk is very important. So that, you know, you can at least save a lot of amount of effort doing a risk analysis or doing mitigation in you know, uh, which are which are not which are relevant, uh, which is not relevant or irrelevant kind of a risk. So, so that is one thing which I like to add on that yes. uh, technology part, basically. Yes, Amit, I think that's a great point. I definitely would like to add to that. So, as a law firm, this is exactly what we do. We manage risks in the employment law space through a lot of legal audits, and what we do is we do a consultative process to understand 
what what is important of course from a legal standpoint certain things are non-negotiable and that has to be included but over and above that what is the risk tolerance level of the organization if we take that into consideration we do risk calibration based on that and risk calibration is not done once it is a continuous process we keep recalibrating based on the environment where are we seeing more summons and notices being issued has anything changed for the organization as a priority and we also have our own scoring algorithms because one size really does not fit all what may work in tax may not work in employment may not work in something else so our, we have our own scoring mechanism so all of these actually need to come together to make that compliance tool as well as the compliance program um, really successful to an organization absolutely and puja it's it's not only about one straight jacket as you said but with every day things are changing like what risk analyses we did two years back or pre-covid era or our past life now i call it is is not the same during covid and now a lot of us are going back to either full time uh, working a full time office in person or hybrid model you know every day things are changing and i always say that that compliance program or or legal and business conduct or grc any program whatever nomenclature may you may use it's a ever evolving organism you have to keep feeding it you have to keep you have to keep seeing it change colors and you have to change your colors yeah, accordingly because the risk is also changing I mean, absolutely with the absolutely course, yeah. and uh, and also you know again another thing uh, that I, i i always emphasize is having a pretty program is good but then what do you do with it a is are you reviewing it often that's one second and i think there was an fcp investigation also it said that okay you had a program you had a very beautiful policy procedure manual whatever you may call it you had an audit team audit team went had some findings what did you do about it so it's also very important that we have the procedure we have the training we have everything but if there is an audit check and balance should be there and if there is check you have to have a remedial action in place you need to follow it up and maybe you know manuvinder as an as an um, as a private practitioner you know it would be lovely to hear your perspective on that no i mean i mean it's amazing that you bring in the fcp audit thing because uh, i think let's understand one thing if you outsource your compliance program to a third party for hr compliance em- employment compliance you have fancy limitation of liability clauses saying that oh our liability will only be the fees that we have paid you that doesn't get you off the hook the company still very well remains as the non compliant entity and no one will go after the third party saying that oh x person was supposed to take care of the compliance and he or she has erred on this part it doesn't get you off the hook but more importantly uh, saloni i don't know if you guys have seen like epc guys would have known the world bank has an integrity pact and a program right so whenever there is a world bank project where there's a let's say corruption or fraud charge these guys come in now why are they different from your uh, fcpa authorities or scc or the sfi in the uk is they keep on following up you have to sign up for a one and a half year training program your projects are going to be audited you have to report to world bank world bank is then going to suggest remedial measure which measures have to be implemented by you and then they will allow you to bid in other world bank projects now the world bank investigations are massive it's almost like a cartel investigation which we do in cci but at the same time that is the level of compliance today i mean let's all understand and appreciate one thing just like we have had time to reassess the regulators the prosecutors the investigation agencies they've also had time they've all gone and recalibrated how really to stick it to us and i and i think that's that's a realization which is very important in the present scenario not true the actually regulator is very smart nowadays and they have got all kind of a tools frankly you know even in insider trading and all um, uh, those who are, who work with listed entity they must be knowing about it what they have done is now uh, you know they are monitoring so you have to you have to upload the data of all your senior people along with their pan number and all every month and they are monitoring your trades and transactions every year and every month and then they send you notices etc so the point here is that they are also using all kind of a technology or kind of intelligence machine learning nowadays and it's very difficult to hide the things Absolutely. perhaps and and the other thing i wanted to say is that you know during this covid era since you were saying the risk is changing and all what we have seen is new kind of a risk which has emerged in covid era is very very important to understand which i don't know so i heard that you know there is one is that 
for example counter fitting counter fitting of masks sanitizer and all this was correct medicine yeah. csf cheese but at the same time what we have you know heard the kind of cases we have seen is you know for example you are sad from your job now you are sitting home you are sitting bored at home and you know somebody call you okay so you know this is kind of a scheme we have and this is where you can do this thing so he gets into that all kind of a trap you know so these kind of a calls plus people are actually trying to uh, you know give you a, a trap you under different things that you know since uh, you, I, I i read a case of uh, twitter uh, you know where's a bored guy sitting in san francisco somewhere 18 19 years old guy and he called up twitter employee and then you know i don't know what he told him he continuously talked to him for half an hour and then twitter employee has given him lot of sensitive data jo aapne dekha hoga i think it was obama's data and other people a lot of other people data so so this is what this is the impact of covid things and all the when you were sitting bored and a lot of lot of things come to your mind fake job scams fake job scams investment opportunities youtube whatsapp groups ask you to invest 1500 rupees to be a billionaire yeah uh, i i i wanted to comment on that so i i really like uh, you know the idea that risk itself you know has been changed before and after and in 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 my view to to ensure that we have robust and successful uh, compliance agenda or to apply a compliance program into the company uh to to again so i'm i'm always thinking about the sustainability and you know the future growing to the compliance agenda we need to follow the elements so so uh, as as we just said we were talking about risk so risk assessment and saluna you were talking about monitoring we were talking about policies and procedures the training comes in a in a very high priority in this situation so also we need to ensure the training and not only implementing the 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 the, the element itself we ensure that we have a long term short term plan in implementing the 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 again so the the element so i i think those items are are very important in my view no the training i think awareness is one of the very important part of that absolutely and you know the the refresher courses and the and the review of your um, uh, framework is very very important i still remember you know we uh, i was giving a training of insider trading and uh, on insider trading of instance specifically yaad aata hai because uh, the guy i told him many times that these are the things you have to do that and suddenly i found a case wherein he took the training 3 uh, 4 months ago and again he did some mistake and then said oh i just forgot i didn't realize that and all so i think refresher courses and all these things are very important uh, you know because unawareness and maybe you know casual approach is something which yeah can i can i comment on that because actually so based on the internal audits okay we got some findings on on trainings right. okay so people all the time so when you ask why didn't you do that you thought i need a training but you already got a training last week so what what goes wrong so the idea here we made a kind of a monitoring on the training program itself and uh, we found out that maybe the training language wasn't very good maybe the training was not interactive enough to get people understand and change the approach from you know just teaching approach into coaching approach so where people can collect more information so this is something really important so yes we deliver training but we need to ensure that we deliver the sufficient and accurate training as well no oh, and i think one thing that we personally have seen a lot is when we work with mncs mm. you know you can't have a standardized module for uk and expect your india japan south korea officers all to implement it in the same manner and your trainer comes in with a very different mindset so one is you have to localize your training modules have to get localized and i'm pretty sure like you would have seen gifting policy right now a $5 gifting policy or a $15 gifting policy may become a substantial sum in an india or a jakarta and then tomorrow when you go and you do it the kind of repercussion that can happen in the potential fcps scenario really changes the game and that is something which is very important why your directors your kmps your legal heads they need to imbibe it like whichever jurisdiction you are in make sure that the domestic risks are highlighted and put forth to the management in a manner that they appreciate it and they don't say oh yeah it's a you know like they've only 
2% revenue generating in the company because by the time it hits you it will take away 10% of your global revenue share absolutely and oh, no. manvendra that's somewhere stitches to what i was saying about cultural sensitivity a lot of times when we are doing a training especially if you are on a global role oh let me put a gift a uh, gift policy or anti corruption let me take an example of anti corruption policy just change the language and do give the same policy to everyone that's not what customization is as manvendra is saying because what as indians may understand the same policy in a different manner somebody from middle east will understand the same policy in a different manner so customization is not language change it is actually to understand how the people will perceive it and also of course you know what are the domestic limitations and permissions that is there another point you know which uh, which ahmed really uh, mentioned which i think is very important is we have a training well and good we do refresher training well and good but how much people understand i think samit also mentioned that you know insider training train check the box everything and i think what ahmed is saying and which is which is i think uh, uh, which is which companies are realizing now is qualitative analysis of how you train and what people understand so you would have seen most of us would have seen we are given an anti corruption policy training and after the policy we have 10 questions as you can choose all the wrong answer you choose one right answer and you move to the next one that's not to me that's not a qualitative uh, analysis the right qualitative analysis is give them 10 days let them digest the policy and then see percentage how many of them out of those question 10 questions how many of your employees what percentile do they fall under did they answer eight questions right seven questions right or three questions right you will be surprised by the kind of answers you will get you will be surprised by the by the feedback that you will give so it's important that we do these tests regularly to understand where the gap is what is uh, that we are missing how as compliance officers or in house counsels are we able to communicate and educate them it's not about training it's educating them making them aware that this is not all right or this is this can be done and this cannot be done and also i would like to say one more thing that you know being customization customization is policy important at the same time you need to be flexible also Absolutely. flexible in the sense that if you so far as you're not breaking any law and you think that this something is not able to work in india then you know you need to be flexible and you have to take up the matter to the upper authorities that this is something so i think one cannot be rigid in certain things so far as you're not breaking the law that's all your policy compliance is something which uh, you know can be flexible exactly it's agility and also empowerment i think we also you know sometimes because of the risks that are there we keep everything very close to our heart but it is important that we categorize risk and uh, or do that risk analysis and let the lower maybe the lower categorization risks one that can be handled by business or other functions because we cannot do everything and i think with empowerment also comes accountability and responsibility so let your baby go let it grow for some time and see how it behaves um so maybe you know um if we can if all the panelists say we can move to tips and tricks of how to manage grc risks uh, some practical aspects insights uh, ahmed would you like to start with that okay so uh, i i will start from what you just finished so so it's all about owners so so always speak with the business owner so business owner knows better so he knows how to you know identify the blind spots into the business practice so so that's one you might have as a compliance person or or as a lawyer working in the, into into this you might have the most structured thinking but this doesn't mean that you know everything so this is something also uh, I, i believe it's it's really important Uh, also documentation and data consolidation for the future use so yes this year we 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 got we got a problem or we 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 got risk so we work together to mitigate and close this gap we need next year to return back to what we have done last year to assess the completion uh, and to assess that the same problem did not occur for the coming year so if the problem occurred that means that we did not tackle the real problem from it, its root cause and this might cause a bigger problem in the future because the gap is still there 
and we don't have a proper mitigation at the first uh, uh, place. Also, interviews and business collaboration uh, ask uh, a lot of questions, so try to apply different examples, try to test uh, the process at each stage. So we talked actually on testing training. So we might also test, uh, so you were talking about uh, Saluna, uh, the correction actions that we we're taking and we still have the same problem. So we also need to test uh, uh, the, 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 the correction and preventive actions. So each element of the program, we have uh, dedicated monitoring uh, uh, elements or KPIs to ensure that we are on the right track. tips and tricks yeah so i think uh, it's very important that uh, because it's a collective effort according to me it's very important that uh, you know the risk guy who is the risk guy you know in consultation with all the business people all the functional head there has to be a review of continuously for your risk framework and we have seen practically that you know at times we see quarter wise quarter basis may there has been new risk there has been risk removed there has been risk rating changed and compliance is merely you know one of the risk but at the same time, we're talking about the governance related risk. We're talking about the reputational related risk. In COVID times, we have seen different kind of a risk and then business risk is asset. And then, uh, you know, corruption related risk, your data related risk, cyber security related risk. So all these things and what kind of a security features you have, what kind of a mitigation you have. So it's, it's actually a great combined effort, which need a dedicated team. And according to me, you know, at least quarterly, it should be reviewed properly so that, you know, you can always on the top of that. Uh, from my perspective, I would say that, okay, I mean, as you mentioned, tone from the top and Samir was saying, uh, sorry, you were saying tone from the bottom and he was saying tone from the top. So as a compliance officer, you have to uh, speak to, in the board directions. Of course, uh, the people who are, I mean, I mean, down you and then the board of directors and the senior management uh, clearly communicate them the policy, the regulatory requirement. And also find some means, I mean, maybe through undertaking, so that they should say, yeah, they have read and understood what are the new regulatory requirements. Because the uh, new fines and, and the new laws which are there on financial crime, especially AML and CFT, and the regulation from Central Bank. So they have given, uh, I mean, a lot of importance on the governance itself. The board of directors, senior management, all of them have to take care of it. I mean, they have to make sure it is implemented. And there are, of course, fines, penalties, and the jail terms as, as well are, is there. So as a compliance officer, in my opinion, I mean, I mean, they have to look at both sides, top and the bottom. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think everything that the co-panelists said till now, a couple of points I want to add to that, and that is keeping vigilance in any GRC program continuous. It will be best if we can remove predictability out of it because at any given point in time, it needs to work. What if there's a surprise check? So therefore, if you want to check it quarterly or half yearly, find a way so that people don't expect it. So at any point in time, when you check, do a dipstick or do an actual check, things are working the way it should. That will ultimately contribute to the success of a GRC program, be it training, be it actual monitoring of compliances. The other thing I want to say is, as much as technology is integral to it, the winning combo, I think, is a human tech combo. Humans cannot be removed. We do need to provide our discretionary input. Our judgment is critical to it. And uh, bringing those two together with the right balance and combination will ultimately work. Because you know, you've got to be beware of tidiness. Everything looks very pretty in a dashboard, but you know, the truth may be kind of different. And um, the last thing is, this is a growing field with the emergence of um, ESG. I think I read somewhere that the software, the revenues for ESG software is, st is slated to double by 2025. So it's certainly a good space to be in um, and we must continue to keep our eyes on it. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think as a law firm lawyer, I would say, let's be practical about it. Like, you know, from shirt and shorts, we are in suits saris, I saw a gentleman in a three-piece. So clearly, uh, the idea is that emotions will be running high. People are coming back into the business. They have done things during the COVID years which they may not have realized is wrong. The most important thing which I would recommend any in-house counsel is do internal investigations. 
appoint lawyers you have your privilege even if you find skeletons you don't need to go and report do internal investigations find the loopholes where the data risk employment risk fraud risk accounts recasting whatever it is ring fence it move ahead there's no point politicizing today because we don't know if there will be another covid we don't know if you will again have two years of your life taken away and the same risk will come again but from a operational perspective ring fence it so that whenever it opens up you know what you have to do like if it's an income tax issue it will come after three years of opening six years of books right you are not fighting it today you will fight it four years down the line that's very important and for all the practitioners who are having coffee at the back if your directors are getting summons please file quashing don't file anticipatory bail restrict the travel after two years finally you know the flights have started let the poor guys hang around a bit but yeah, i think those are the two important takeaways from me Thanks. and you know one more uh, i just wanted to add something one more uh, point uh, generally we face is and i was talking to somebody at the lunch time we as a legal counsel you know there is another risk which is a risk of litigation tomorrow it's a bigger risk you know whenever we do any contracting any business assignment anything so i was telling somebody then we have to actually we have two opposite parties one is the other side party other is inside party who is always telling us please please close it please close it and that's where we see a lot of risk because if i don't put the appropriate clauses in the contract or don't do you know appropriate uh, due diligences or appropriate things then tomorrow who is going to suffer that it's a great great risk and that's the reason you know and i tell them very clearly that boss i am paid for my legal duties though i am a business enabler i know the business is critical for you but look for i am paid i am paid for the, for the legal things i am not paid for the business thing so i have to do my duty and that's for you know this is again Manvendra is very excited Dr. to Sabitsa, talk about that. That's exactly the point. Your risk of litigation and risk of liability are two very distinct things. You have to focus on your risk of liability. No matter what you do, you can't regulate your risk of litigation. And there's no point speculating and wasting time on trying to say settle it. Okay, great, I'll settle it. What do I do? I pay him forty thousand rupees. Okay, under what head? What do you do like tomorrow when someone comes and asks you, okay, on what basis did you pay him? Settlement agreement. Great. How did you show it in your book of accounts? So the risk of liability is what should be the focus, and that is very very critical in today's date with the cost that we are seeing in litigation, the timelines, and some great benches who don't hear matters. For okay, let's not get started. But I think Manvinder, that's very important because a lot of time we 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 don't intelligently decide whether we want to go for litigation or arbitration. It is like are we spending good money, like fifty lakhs for an eighty lakhs matter? I'm talking in INR. but it's not only about that them sometimes you have to do litigation or initiate an arbitration because also the kind of liabilities it is leaving it's not only about money when you decide whether you want to go ahead not go ahead it has to be a full 360 degree view so another thing you know maybe the tricks that i i always have up my sleeve is uh, that while we always talk about the uh, what we can do in, internally as as a company it is also important that talk to your peer companies talk to the industry and i think ahmed and i we are from the same uh, industry and so is your sir so what we do is we always get and and i think ahmed may agree with me sometimes our team members and come and say oh for example bosh is doing it but you are not letting us do that that's a common thing that we as in house counsel get it so it is good to talk to your uh, you know peer companies because what you are facing is exactly what they are also facing and the power of industry or collective voice is very very huge as an in industry if you have an issue you take to the regulators they will they will have maybe they'll give you a, a, a lend a bigger ear than if you go as an individual so please talk the other company if it is healthcare or any other they are not your competitors alone they are also your peers they are also your friends so do talk to them and um, other thing is i think uh, your sir we have not forgotten you issue online is your sir online are we aware okay so um anything else or or if audience and and the coffee drinkers if they have any questions for us it will be lovely to hear your your inter, uh, your questions and if we if any of us had raised any sense to you all can somebody uh, assist the gentleman here hi Uh, my name is Zaryab. Uh, I'm from Delhi. Uh, so I just wanted to what Manvinder was uh, saying in respect of uh, the change in attitude of the regulators that they are going after the directors. 
and uh, that whole uh, approach that has changed. So I want to know whether there's too much of GRC and other compliances, which is affecting the business perspective of it, that the directors uh, for the investment sentiment and all uh, what I wanted to know. No, I think a uh, very great question. See, the point here is very simple. Why are they really going after the directors? It's because they're not getting the cooperation at a lower level. That's the first part, right? More importantly, if your compliances are in check, other than the statutory laws, air, water, explosives, where it has to go to the director, you won't have a situation where the directorial level invocation is required. So as a company, create a mindset, create an image where they know that even if I summon the person or the manager in charge, I'll get the data or I'll get that cooperation. And that is what I was trying to, like, you know, like as a, as a practitioner, the, the maintenance is, oh, gave a summons. This is unmaintainable. Let's file a quashing. Great. You can file a quashing. But if you go and give that data, which is innocuous, you are, you are getting a cultural mindset in. And the regulator also feels that, okay, I will be safe. You know, like these guys are going to cooperate. I don't really need to go and chase after them. That, I think, is the important bit. And yes, we in India have the whole promoter director mindset. That really needs to change. You cannot say that just because the company is yours, you can get away with something that a normal professional director will not be able to get away with. I think that's that's critical in today's rate. And also, Manvendra, maybe I'm widening the question. It is also in, enough or one of the consideration these days is, have you done enough? I think that's very important. See, none of the organization will be perfect. That's the reality. And we, as much as we hope, there will be non-compliances. You, they will always have a bad melon in the mar in the cart. That is the truth. That is something that we have to live with. But what is relevant is what you ought to have known, not keeping a blind eye. And second is what you have is that sufficient for the kind of business you are handling, the kind of risks that you are doing. And that's what I think all the panelists here have been saying is about risk analysis, customization. I think that's very very important. Another aspect and and uh, is that. Like I said, there will be non-compliances. That, that's, uh, that's the underlining point. There would be there. It is also about intelligent disclosure to the regulator. Like, and I think a lot of us have spoken about FCPA. And why I've used the words intelligent and Manvendra is laughing and I can understand the humor. We have seen companies who have just gone and vomited everything. And we have some companies who have kept everything to their heart. I, I, and I maybe, maybe it's a controversial statement to say, I'm not in either of the side. You have to intelligently disclose what you have. When I say intelligently disclose, it's not misrepresentation. This is not what I'm saying. But, and it is there for data privacy concerns, it's there in FCPA also, is you don't go with the problem to regulator. You go with the problem on non-compliance and a solution. That is what they're looking. They are aware that you have done something, but what have you done about it? This again stitches back to what I was saying is follow-up is really important. So this is when I say intelligent disclosure. Go with the solution. Go what you have in your kitty and this is what you do. Because that will also give them, rather than giving a unilateral decision, okay, FCPA, I will, I'm happy to do a deferred prosecution agreement, but you have to do X, Y, Z. So you go with the proposal that I, you know, let me start with ABC. And which also, you know, fits with your company, its culture. And then they may add, you know, X and the Ys and the Zs, but at least you have some foot through the door. You have some say with the regulator. So I think that's what I no, want. No, I to think uh, you're right. Very right. Very, very, very right. That absolutely intelligence disclosure. I mean, the to the point disclosure is absolutely required. Nothing more, nothing less. And this is very true to this today's context also because I'm, I'm just, you know, from the from the perspective of a listed company again, I'm telling you, nowadays there is a lot of activism, shareholder activism, plus proxy advisory's role in that and everyone knows about that. Now what is happening is that, you know, they have started automatically rating your company on the basis of your disclosure and, you know, reporting and all. That is one part of it. The other risk we are carrying is that, you know, the passing of special resolutions where you have all the important matters to be passed by shareholders and then proxy advisory is not supporting that. No institutional shareholder will definitely, you know, give you uh, voting in that. And that's a big, big risk at today's date we are carrying. For example, take a related party transaction. The promoters cannot vote, related party cannot vote and shareholders and the financial institution will not vote because proxy advisory has said no. So what will happen to that transaction? So I think disclosure is a very very important point of the governance i would say and you know it's complete 
complete uh, you know important issue on the GRC framework. You know, you uh, said something which is really, uh, which I, I can give you a very funny example. So I'd not been to the US and whenever I used to see American companies, oh, incorporated in Delaware, I'm like, whoa, what, what is it? Like, why are we, this is like some, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley wasn't that. And I was like, what is it? Then you realize, you know, once you, uh, like I've studied in Berkeley and I fortunately mm -hmm. or unfortunately did companies law as a subject. And then I realized that, you know, it is the activism, the liability of directors, which is very different from state to state so that's why you know delaware is one of their favorite place to be incorporated at and i think there was somebody who yeah. wanted to raise a question yes uh, uh yes. good evening everyone and uh, first of all i would like to very enriching discussion yes. and uh, uh manvinder spoke about being a litigator uh, on the director's liability yes. uh, and the vicarious liability and puja talk uh, spoke about uh, the role of technology the role of data protection uh, Saloni spoke about the cultural shift. So mm -hmm. Saloni, I have a specific question from you. Uh, I, I think this is a question in furtherance of... Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. compliance being an enabling function in an organization. Yeah. However, uh, mm -hmm. there is a very thin line when the business starts mm -hmm. feeling that compliance is uh, instead mm -hmm. of being enabling, it's be started becoming enabling. So uh, mm -hmm. what cultural uh, measures or uh, specific, uh, uh, I mean, uh, from mm -hmm. your experience, uh, to build yes, on the trust of the business on the compliance yes, aspects. What active steps should be taken in from your experience, yes, if you can yes. just throw light on that. So Rohit, I think, um, and I spoke about it is, first, now I don't call myself a lawyer. I call myself a business person with perhaps a bit of a legal knowledge. Because, you know, um, when we say that we are in-house counsel, it is also about supporting business or enabling business, not enabling. I think, uh, and all, all uh, in-house counsel or, or even uh, now um, private practitioners can state that there is a lot of perception that we fight against. So it is very important that we, you know, um, involve them in the decision-making process. When we're putting a policy together, involve them. Ask them, like I said, you know, we are not at the ground. We are not interaction with interacting with healthcare professionals. They are. So it is important that you interact with them. Once you have their alignment, minute it, put a policy in together. So once once they know what you, why you are putting this, what you have put, I think then you somewhere have their alignment and somewhere have their support. Other thing that I mentioned about is change the verbatim. Do not call yourself a support function. Do not call yourself a, a gatekeeper role. No, I don't think so. Compliance officer is gatekeeper anymore. We are, we are, as you said, enabling. We are business partner. Strategic business partner is is my mantra. And uh, so, change the verbatim. Use the word fact finding exercise. Use the word you know change rather than work instructions. Use the word work guidance. You know it may sound very inane, but it really matters. People find it very intimidating when you say investigation has been initiated, but they are a little more cooperative if you say it's a fact finding. Another thing is, please explain. I have also seen, I think somebody talked about investigation. A lot of times what happens is we do an investigation, everything is okay, but we never speak about the result. So for example, Rohit, God forbid, there is an investigation against you. You don't know what happened to the investigation. What was the result? Please communicate to them. Talk to them, give them examples, give, explain yourself to them. I think once they understand the rationality is a little more easy. And again, you know, my co-panelists have said, talked about customization, cultural sensitivity. And I think maybe Adil and Pooja yeah. would like to add. Yeah, I want to um, add to what uh, Saloni said. So building on that, I have one recommendation. You know, I've been on both sides of the house. My career in the U.S. has been... Um, you know, in company where I was heading um, the compliance and audit uh, affinity group. And in my avatar here in India, um, I'm in the law firm. So having seen both sides of the house, I think if business talks to you and finds and treats you as a cost, a cost center, then I have one quote from Paul McNulty. I think it's a common quote. Many people may have heard it. They say, if you think compliance is costly, try non-compliance. And then you should rest your case. Uh, so I would like to just few words I would like to add. So what I've seen, I've seen in most of the organizations that the compliance sits at the last on the table. So let's say <laughs> in the uh, one example, if you, I mean, the business wants to, I mean, uh, develop a new product. So they have done everything 
everything is done i mean marketing plan is ready then they will come to compliance please approve it then compliance is i mean guys i mean i have to make sure i mean it is complying with the rules and regulation or no so if you if you i mean the businesses include compliance from the very start obviously we will be very helpful i mean compliance will be really helpful uh, sort out the matters wherever i mean as uh, i mean uh, i mean we say i mean uh, wherever there's a gap in the regulation where we can use it for our benefit i mean of course we will gonna i mean recommend i mean so uh, this is my i mean my so have you ever broken a deal <laughs> <laughs> i think that's that's one thing what we are looking for is you know if there is a requirement to break the deal you have to do that what Absolutely. do we do True. i mean I after think that, all uh, the efforts uh, uh, sumit what is important and i think what rohit is asking we have to say no at times yeah, guys course. that is the last resort yeah. we have to say no where we have to Correct. say no so one but, yeah. but uh, what is important is they should the trust should be there when you're saying no it is actually the last resort you have made hmm. all the effort nothing has worked out and i think that's something we all deal, deal whether it's conflict of interest and so on there is something we can cannot do no, and, and it's changed reason. it's changed see there was a point of time and it used to be risk to comment compliance to comment legal to comment and you know that is where people were like oh who's going to throw the spanner here and more often than not yes it was compliance because they had the heightened sense right but that's not the, word, the way it's operating anymore even in our teams they do understand they speak there are common heads today business heads and i just need to set the record straight i started off with i say say back i've been on the dark side before i went over so yeah i've been in our council for two years so yeah no i i but very 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 good point it has to be seen as a system where people are understanding that whatever you are doing is going to save them money liability in future and it's not a system of who really is throwing a spanner in the works at this point of time Sorry. but sir will tell you how Sorry. the deal is to be done no no <laughs> no i'm i'm telling you it's always so we, i always tell them that whenever you in, you have to involve legal or compliance please involve them in the beginning and that's a mantra they you don't hesitate to involve us here we are not going to break the deal we are not here to break the deal we are business enabler we are business facilitator but definitely we have paid for our job and let us do our job so please involve us in the beginning and rather than if you don't want to involve me involve a law firm here at least one of my friend will get some business out of that instead of getting a litigation later you have to pay to the law firm play it now you know involve the law firm right now okay. correct i think working shoulder to shoulder is really important uh, i think rohit so maybe the trick is get involved in the deal from the start before you say no <laughs> any other question or should we wrap up yeah <laughs> Everyone is enjoying. So coffee. panelists uh, would love to have coffee. So by with this, thank you so much. It was pleasure, or and I can say it for all of us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.